ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for showing up today uh, to address this important issue of gender equality when it comes to women in finance. I think in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, I've seen a great transformation in the acceptance of women in finance, and there are first generation leaders such as you who have actually broken the glass ceiling, and so many women today are running investment banks, banks, asset management companies in India today. And we are here to sort of share these inspiring stories. We've already heard from Nena before, and now we have the privilege of having Manisha with us. Manisha absolutely embodies what a successful, modern, powerful woman should look like today. I mean, Manisha, you successfully run an investment bank. You hobnob with the creme de la creme when it comes to the corporate world. Uh, you're a doting mother and a loving wife. And she even has what a she very was a loving wife. <laughs> Well, she's managed the conflict of being married to a competing investment banker rather well over many years. And uh, she also has a mean uh, golf handicap guide, and that too looking like a million bucks. So, uh, Manisha, Shabi, and I used to work together, so this is all very biased to me, guys. Uh, I think it was a pinch of salt as we go. So, so I was actually just going to share that in the full spirit of transparency, I should lay it out there that I have worked for you. And uh, she still continues to be my most favorite uh, person I work for. And she was so encouraging to a young and fledgling investment banker at the time when I joined UBS a few years back. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, thank you so much for joining us over here today. So Manisha, I know this whole topic of uh, gender equality is important to you because you recently published an article with Work Magazine. And you talked about gender equality. And you said that it's not actually just a women's issue, but it is, in fact, a human issue. So would you just care to elaborate that for the benefit of the audience? Sure, thanks, Shavi. I think you know all of you are very aware, and I think uh, I heard some questions in the last round, which was like, when will we get the men engaged? Uh, you know, the, we are all engaged. We all understand this issue. We all empathize with each other. You know, if, uh, when I when I got gotten people like Shavi to come and work with me, I wanted her to succeed more than she wanted to succeed because you know I just felt that passion that women must come up. But when am I going to get my male colleagues to feel like that? When am I going to get the ecosystem to feel like that? Uh, the ecosystem tends to be very biased towards uh, towards men. I think someone raised a question earlier that you know women do the work at home as well as in office, and you know it, that does take a toll, right? I mean, the way I feel for my home, I don't think my husband can. Or if I tell him, God, the house is so dirty, he's like, where? And I'm like, you know, the house we live in, guys, it's not looking very clean, and he's like, looks fine. So I think you know, I think you need to get the men engaged. I think you need to get the men to feel ownership for the home too. And when the men feel that ownership, don't judge them wrongly, right? Uh, so many of my daughter's um, friends, mums would come up to Sanjay, my husband, if he took my daughter to that odd birthday party and say, you're such a great dad, you know, that's why Manisha can work, because you take do all this. I mean, taking my daughter for two hours on a Sunday evening for a birthday party surely can't be hard, right? But you know, that's how he was glorified. And if I missed one birthday party, equally I was judged as being this bad mom who's just sitting at home and, or, you know, being at work at some meeting. So, I think that really was my point that, look, the ecosystem has to change to give women a fair chance. It can't just be women fighting for women. That's very important for the women networks are important. But I think we need to engage the men. We need to change the mindset at home, which are very few, uh, which support the male working and the woman sort of falling off the work chart as soon as she gets married or has a kid. And that's really where it came from. That you know, I think that if we change that, I think that's really when all of us will get an equal chance. So let's stay with that. Uh, what can actually change the attitude of men? Is it education? Is it conditioning? Uh, from their mothers, and in most importantly, how to handle issues like male ego. I mean, let's that lay that out there. It is something which we deal with. I think it, it needs all hands to the deck. It needs the work environment. At work, you need to just, you know, when you have your gender diversity groups, the, I'm sure the men are there. I'm so happy to see so many men here. You know, it's really important that men must hear the issues too, because firstly, to just step back, why is this important? It's important to have diverse uh, organizations to succeed. If I'm at a Procter & Gamble or I'm in a financial services firm, my clients are both men and women. If I need to understand how my female customer is working, I need to have diversity in my own organization to understand what the client needs. So, so just for that, you need, uh, you, know, you need women to work. First, because it's good economics. If you, if you just step back and say, how do you get women to be more engaged? You need to change the mindset at work. Men must feel the ownership that women must succeed. Don't judge them. Don't form boys club. You know, don't make the woman feel singled out. So many times in you know breakout areas and lunch areas, you just see the men sort of having cracking a few jokes and leaving the women out. You know, it just it plays on the women, right? They feel they don't belong. So one is just change the mindset that the organizations, in all your diversity of the councils, etc., have male representation too. And secondly, at home, I think the mindset.
mindset that home needs to change uh, drastically. And mindset of all of us uh, women as moms must change, you know. Uh, we must ensure that girls and boys, I mean, and all of us do, we all ensure girls and boys are brought up equally. But I think you must uh, impose into a, into a male child that, you know, as he grows up, his partner will be as relevant uh, in, in the work front as in the personal front. I have this, uh, my daughter's uh, friend's mom who said to me that I, she you know, sent her kids into different schools. She sent her boy to a more competitive school and her girl to a softer school. And I said, why are you doing that? And she said, and you know, really well to do family, everything. She said, you know, it's fine. She has to get married and go away. So it's important she learns the softer skills. And the boy has to go out there and look after his business. And I tell you, that girl is 100 times smarter than that boy. She will run circles around him, you know, given a chance. So, you know, it bothers me. So that mindset, we women must change too. We must take the ownership on ourselves because I think a lot of the feudal mindset comes from the home and comes from the moms who basically just, you know, we have this huge deep bias towards the male child and that needs to change uh, to my mind. And I, and I see this, and it, you know, it's not that much more in educated families today. So as a woman, what point of time in your life did you decide what to take? So what made you take that decision? And if it was a dream, then how did you work towards fulfilling it? So I was an accidental investment banker. I wanted to actually do a PhD in economics and I come from a middle class uh, government family. They didn't have the money to uh, send me off to do a PhD. I did my master's and I thought I'd work for two, three years and you know, collect the money and then go off to do my PhD. I met my husband and the rest is history. But more importantly, I loved investment banking. I just loved what I did. And I think that's the most important thing for all of you women here who are working and are entrepreneurs, that you must love what you do. Because I think the journey is so hard and gets so much harder as you have children. I mean, it's all very well that you know you have supportive husband, supportive ecosystem. The reality is that all of us do feel guilty. We do feel a greater sense of ownership for our home than our husbands do. So the journey gets so much tougher that it's important that you must love what you do. And I think that's what happened. I just loved what I did. Uh, there was a lot of gender bias towards me initially, especially because I wanted to do investment banking. Uh, we were all hired, my batch was hired because they wanted to just have the women work in retail banking and you know, they felt women have good uh, frontline skills and that's where they wanted to uh, get the women in front in, in the organization. I wanted to do investment banking, but that, that itself was difficult because it was this complete male's world. It was called merchant banking then, it was like an all boys club. So it was hard enough getting in there. It was really hard once I got there because people didn't know quite what to do with me. They didn't think I could go in and you know do the IPO or do the m &A. So they would give me tasks like go. You know, we used to have. We never had. It was the world was computerized then. So they would say go stick stickers on all the chairs and tables and take an account of the stationery and the and the inventory of the chairs and tables. So I did that happily. I was like, cool, I'll do it. Then my other boss would tell me, go get me a pizza. Every day at 12.30, he needed a pizza. So I would go get the pizza. Whatever, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever you do, but I won't go away. So you take me seriously. So for the about five, six months, there was trivialization, there was objectification, there were all sorts of silly comments passed. You know, their rules were so st uh, strict against uh, all of these uh, conversations, casual conversations. So they all that. And six months later, there was some somebody who was unaware or something, and you know, they, they, they grudgingly gave me his work, and then I you know, took up the challenge to work 24 times 7, and then I think gradually people started taking me seriously. Initially, people would shake my hand, they didn't know what to do with me, they were like, now, what are we supposed to do with this woman when she comes into a meeting? And what's, what's strange is, as I went along to, and Chavi will endorse this, is that when we would go into a meeting, the let's say Chavi and me, there were two male colleagues, all the questions would go to the male colleagues and all the answers would come from the male colleagues. And Chavi's got this whole presentation ready and Chavi wants to make a point. But Chavi cannot make a point or, and Aisha absolutely can't make a point. We're just too aggressive women who are just around and you know, the, the questions would go to the men and you know, they make eye contact with the men. So it's, it's just something, you know, you just have to keep fighting. You just have to ignore it. You keep giving your answers. You keep going back, you know. I think the key thing in all our jobs is to show resilience and you know, um, just have a thick skin, guys. I mean, you know. The guys are also having a paradigm shift. A lot of them after they became friends, and you know, they actually felt threatened because they had only seen uh, uh, women as secretaries or at best journalists, and you know, now you're this women coming in and having these hard ECF discussions and MA discussions, and, and they're not used to it. So they are feeling their own paradigm shift, and that's getting challenged. So do feel a little sympathy for them, not too much, but a little bit, and just keep going. Yeah, that's why after a point, we stopped taking the men to meetings. This is just Manisha and I. <laughs> Uh, but you talked about you know resilience and tenacity and investment banking and we actually saw a lot of what it is. So you have the whole Lehman crisis and then you have this whole shift where investment banks don't want to climb. So haven't been the easiest field to work in from that perspective. And women at least tend to be more emotional. So some of the stakes are low. So how did you handle all of that? How did you handle the water? 
So I think investment banking as a career, as, as I'm sure a lot of you are entrepreneurs know, that it's not going to be an easy ride. If I've signed up for investment banking, which is, you know, got its own volatility in a country like India, it's an emerging market, it goes in and out of favor with uh, global firms. You just have to be ready for the ride. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have layoffs. You're going to have to personally have to take layoffs. You're going to personally have to face failures. Uh, and, you know, so long as you brace yourself for the ride, because the, when, it gets going, when it's good, it's really good. But, you know, like anything else which is volatile uh, and cyclical, you know, it does have its challenges. And I think you just need to be brave hearted. Much like, much like all of you, I think, are entrepreneurs, you know it, right? You've braced yourself for the ride. You know there are times you're going to fail. But, you know, then when you succeed, it's going to be all the more sweeter. So, I need just pull your eyes wide open. Um, how easy or difficult is it to win business at the moment? That was a key part of what you were doing as Jeff was going to be at the now you're doing more. And how does that differ with the VMI? So I think uh, if you cut back to 25 years ago when I started, it was much harder because you know people just couldn't relate to women in this business. It has got easier as more and more, as Neha said earlier too, there are more women in financial services. So as Financial services is really the uh, one area where women have done very well because the ecosystem has sort of favored uh, and benefited women uh, working. So I think it got easier over the years, but you still you still feel a lot of uh, prejudgment when you enter a lot of the boardrooms. And somebody earlier had this question of boardrooms, and I'm on a couple of boards, and I'm the only woman director on that board, and you know it's sort of and that's because SEBI sort of mandated that there should be women on board. And then you sort of you can see that people are a bit the whole system is a bit upset and challenged as to what you do with. Uh, you know, what are we supposed to do with this woman? But I think the key is, I like anywhere else, you just have to know your work. You know, and as a woman, you must work doubly hard to ensure that you can answer all the questions, stay the course, you know, uh, be able to, uh, you know, be able to finally deal, deal with the client with sincerity, etc. that he's expecting. And finally, he'll take you seriously. I can tell you, it's twice or thrice as harder as any male colleague of mine. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, for me to prove my credibility, sustain my credibility, is twice or thrice harder. Uh, I recall when I was uh, pregnant, I was a CEO of UPS then, and that, this is a while ago, my daughter was 15 years old. And we had a small team at that time. And uh, I hid my pregnancy till I, she was, my daughter was eight months into my stomach when I thought I was just really good. And people were looking at the male clients, we were a bit surprised that she was getting a bit too fat too soon, but you know, nobody asked the they did context, thankfully. But you know, that was how awkward it was because I felt I wouldn't win business, right? I mean, people thought I was pregnant, it would business and so all sorts of strange challenges come and you know you just have to deal with it in your own way and uh, and, and you know just keep pushing and then people realize that you know, and, and after my daughter was three months uh, uh, old I came back to work so you know people saw that I was serious about my work and I traveled three months into my work I took my daughter to work in the fourth month there were no pressures etc at that time and you just have to keep proving your sincerity it's hard it's challenging it's hard on the family it's hard on your child uh, but you know uh, you just have to, that, which is why it goes back to my first point. You must love what you do because it is going to be hard. And it's also hard to ask your male counterpart. No journey is easy. No career is easy. Uh, yours is, ours is tougher because it's just, you know, the personal work front gets also challenging. But that's why I just keep coming back to the same thing that you have to love what you do and then the rest. And have a good husband. If you don't have a good husband, beat him up. Uh, and make sure you train him well. Every now and then you have to beat him up. And then, and then the journey becomes easy. So you talked about the role of personal support, but what about organizational support? So what are some of the practices which UBS or models have which actually support women? So I think it's very important at work, you must encourage women. And I think earlier also there was this question of flexible hours. I think it's really important and it's so easy now because of the way you can basically connect from home, you know, do all your work. A lot of the work in investment banking is, uh, is, is while it's client facing, you have to come back and do a lot of the work back in office. And you don't necessarily have to sit in office. I mean, earlier, all your research reports, etc., you had to print, keep them. Now, no longer. Everything's available on the net. So, you know, let women work uh, flexible hours. Don't judge people by the number of hours they put in. I think Indians have this great mentality that Saturday must be a working day, too, and your know, office hours must be till 7 p.m. And if somebody goes away at 6 15 p.m., it's seen as a, you know, something that should be put in a performance appraisal. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That's just archaic thinking, right? And if that's kind of thinking, you're never going to have the woman stay on. Uh, you know, a woman needs a weekend. You know, as, as a working woman, as a working mom, I need my Saturdays and Sundays. I need some downtime, and then I also need time to manage my family. So I think all of that, organizations absolutely owe it. And I think financial services led the way there. They sort of made it okay, made Saturdays a holiday, made flexi working hours, you know, offline working, creches, support systems. Uh, and I think organizations and manufacturing and other 
or in the, you know, in the technology, etc. need to do the same. You absolutely need to retain your women because I think where you look at women at the entry level, and all of us basically try and ensure that the diversity ratio is more or less equal initially. But the key challenge is to retain them when they start having their babies because a your own milk factor plays, ecosystem plays on you, and at that point, in that four five years, you can just retain the woman. I promise you, the woman at work is far more loyal than the man at work. I can, I mean, I, I, it is, my, it is a big statement I make, but I see all the women at work in my office, both my organizations, in 25 years, being so much more fiercely loyal to an employer. If you just, you know, being a part of their journey, if you help them through, men quit jobs for a little bit extra. Women don't; they stay on because they just feel so fiercely loyal. If you sort of help, you know, if you hand help them through their journey, and investment banking tends to be a very volatile business, as Charlie mentioned. So people don't tend to quit jobs uh, faster. And I always see women stay on longer. One of the other ways in which uh, you know we sort of address equality is in pay and in compensation. And there's still quite a wide gap when you look at that in financial services. So again, at an organizational level, what can be done to sort of bridge that gap? And any other suggestions you have on how to bridge it? Sure, I think one is equal pay, but I think the more important thing is giving women the mission critical jobs. I think typically what happens is that if there's a challenging job, there's a job, let's say, if I win a piece of business in Nagpur, then I think, oh, maybe I should just send my immediate colleague to be able to live in a small hotel, do the work, live long hours, work long hours there, etc. So by definition, by doing that itself, I've handicapped the woman. I've said, I can't send you to these smaller towns. I must keep you to bigger towns. I must really keep your assignments in Bombay and Delhi. I'm worried on safety issues, etc. And so that itself deprives the woman because by giving the male the mission critical assignments at a younger age, you've actually made them more experienced. So by, by default, the woman just keeps lagging behind just by that because, you know, the minute a male colleague is able to show what more uh, well-rounded CV, I'm going to give more and more now, so it feeds on itself. So I think firstly, equip your women to basically take on the mission critical uh, jobs right from the beginning. As you as women must come up, say we're going to do it, it's very important. You all must lean in and say, look, we can do this, there's no problem. Uh, of course, safety issues are, are you know, something that none of us should compromise on. Uh, and organizations need to have their, their own uh, you know, facilities to do that. But you as women must do it and organizations must offer that. And then the equal pay will follow. Why does the equal pay not follow? Because women are doing the tougher jobs, the bigger roles, the CEO roles that was mentioned earlier. Because you know, they're just not being assigned to these, uh, to these uh, difficult tasks. The amount of policies coming in place and organizations are starting to recognize it. There's still a lot of unconscious bias which remains with them. So how do you address that? I think that's the key. That's why we don't get the visibility we need. I, that, it goes back to the earlier point. Any uh, council forum, anything that you hold in your organizations on gender issues, please get the men involved. They'll come in grudgingly because it's not cool to be seen in these places. It's not martial to be seen in these places. But just make them sit in. You know, just say come for half an hour, come for 45 minutes. The other day I had this, I taken my team out for drinks, and one of the girls said, you know, for fitness she does Zumba. Zumba is this dance form for fitness. And all the guys laughed at her. And I was like, what do you laugh? You know? And I forced them to come down to a Zumba, a Zumba class in our building. And I said, you come down and you see it. And a couple of them actually participated. Uh, and you know, I said, was this easy? And they said, no, it was really tough. You know? And they're all into like lifting weights, etc. But you know, you just have to get them to see what women do is fine, what accept what women do is fine. You know, you, you, you laugh at the girl and she says, Zumba, she's just going to feel more, hes more hesitant, you know, just talking about how she is as a person. So, Get the men to respect the women at work and you know, just make it part of their DNA. Just just force it upon them. They may not like it initially. It will just becomes a way of life. You know, both at home and at work, you just have to force it because we come from such a different mindset. So you know, to change it now is is going to need the pendulum to, uh, to switch to the other end. And all of you women here, I think, owe it to other women to just uh, to push their agenda. Even if, even if it sounds a bit irrational at times. I mean, I thought the guys might think I was mad when I took them to the Zumba class. But, you know, too bad. So you uh, talk about uh, forcing the issue. So one of the ways in which that has been imposed on this country is that 50% role and now women being necessarily on the board. So the quota system is over. Is that something you think which works? And uh, what else can be done over and above that? So I think, you know, there's, there's a big debate on you know, this whole one director on board, do we have the right talent, etc. And I think, you know, you may get in for the wrong reasons, but you must stay on for the right reasons. I may have got in because I have to fulfill that quota, but then it's up to me to understand the company, understand the business, 
And then, and then, then as you are able to demonstrate that you are actually a valuable director, people encourage you to, you know, one more women director. For example, I'm on the board of Mindtree, where there are two directors, women directors, right? Because the first female director, which is not me, is another lady. Uh, actually did such a great job in helping with the company's business that they actually felt, you know, this is great. We need to have a more diversity on the board. I'm on the board of a show given where I'm the first woman director and they, they keep telling me find us another woman director because you know I I've, I've made sure. I don't know anything about trucks. I don't care about trucks, but I've made sure that you know I figure out how the pure technology and trucks work, what do truck what truck drivers think, how are these things financed? Because I do want to make a make that guy do it. So you know, if all of you are getting these chances to be on the boards, you must you must uh, make double the effort. It's a real boys' club, so it's a bit daunting, but you know, uh, just just keep going uh, like you do in your workspace. And I, I would love to see the quota increase to two. You know, uh, and now I think there is a recommendation at uh, the quota committee, which is that all the directors should not be from the family. You know, like they're women directors. So that's good change. And I think you know, Norway, etc. I know the board of a French company. Fifty percent of women. Nobody even thinks about it. And you know, that I hope by the time you younger generation get to board levels, etc. That becomes a way of life. And that's why it's important for the first set of directors to, like the first set of entrepreneurs and in, in, uh, female entrepreneurs, to do a little bit more because you, have, you have to help with that whole mindset change. Let's uh, talk about bringing in more women into the workforce and finance. So, how do we handle recruitment? And, uh, you know, of course, I think most of the big banks, for example, go to the different schools. But what else can be done to induct more women into the field? I mean, the problem is not at the entry level. The entry level is just fine. The entry level, I think everyone's making conscious uh, decisions to hire as many women. The ratios are as high as 50%. I think the issue is really when you know the incomes get comfortable levels, mid 30s, the husband's income is enough to you know support two jobs, or the husband's getting posted somewhere, and the kids have happened. Then it's the ecosystem that basically encourages you to quit. The problem is to you know we have to stop thinking of the woman's uh, job as just something which is there for income enhancing. You know, it was good to enhance the income, the families, you know, so being supported. You have to think of my career as a career, right? That these are my aspirations, these are my, my choices, this is what I want to do as, a, as a, both the organization as well as uh, people at home. And I think that's where each organization needs to do more. Manufacturing needs to do a lot more, you know. Uh, in terms of, uh, and a lot of firms are doing it in terms of just providing security because you know all those issues are huge in India. So organizations are trying to do their bit, and uh, I think that's really the challenge. The challenge is the gender gap is so acute that as soon as women are five, seven years into working, women themselves, so many women have come to me and said, now we need to be with the child, you know, it's, it's not nice, I'm not doing well. And my mother, I'm a, by the way, the moms I think are as much, or moms or girls are as much to blame as mom. I think my mom, my mom wants our pillows should be lavender smelling. There are not really any lavender smelling pillows in her life at our home, right? So our moms are very judgmental on how we run homes. So I think that needs to change. Uh, but yeah, I think organizations need to do a lot more in terms of retaining women at that time, and that can only come if you respect flexible hours, offline working, paternity leaves. You know, maternity leaves are important, but paternity leaves are important too, right? So all of that is really that. Uh, I, to in my experience, that's what needs to change. Yeah. So the important issue is then to address the conflict which is there between a woman as a family in a familiar role and a woman who is a career woman. So let's talk about your personal experience. What have been the issues of conflict for you? So when Tara was, you know, growing up, for example, and how did you handle that? I think it would be helpful to share that. Yeah, so huge conflicts. Look, you know, when kids, especially now she's 14, so it's different, but you know, when she was younger, you just, the guilt feels, just kills you, right? Especially if your daughter's unwell, or you know, there's a parent-teacher meeting which you're missing out, which invariably I missed out. I don't know why that one meeting in Chennai had to be on that day of a parent-teacher meeting, but it was, you know, it's Murphy's Law. So I think that's really uh, the time that you feel uh, you know, very strained. And that's where I think, for me at least, a supportive spouse helps. Because it's Sanjay would always say to me, it's a three-year-old parent teacher meeting. Just get a grip on yourself. What are you going to be told that she plays with bangles really well, right? Just to put things in person. So you need some of that because you know, otherwise the guilt just drives you so much. But there were challenges, especially when if she was unwell and you know, if you're leaving an ailing child at home, it's just it just devastates you. And, my husband can say it's fever, it comes and it goes, but we don't think like that as moms. So I think some of those challenges were very huge, especially because you know when I when I was heading to yes, the smaller team, so I had to be everywhere and you know, you, you sort of had to be personally leading all all, all the roles. And um, I think it's just you just have to take it one day at a time. You know, if you start overthinking it and say, look, when she's five, I will do this, and when she's seven, I'll be, you know go back and do my yoga. It's not life doesn't go by plan. Just take it a day at a time. 
stay the course, say this is what I want to do, draw on resources. I think you know India is a great one where if you can actually draw on your parents and your ignores to support you, they actually feel a sense of pride and ownership. And I think that's another thing we do in our organizations very well, which is that we actually involve the parents. For example, if there is an analyst and associate who's a female analyst or associate who's done very well, they actually have dinner with the parents, bring them in, give the award in front of the uh, parents. You know, you build a you build a sense of pride in the woman's job with the whole ecosystem. So that the ecosystem wants to support her, you know. Uh, one of the mums in law is uh, one of my colleagues came and said to me, it's so good, you know, I put that photograph of my daughter-in-law in the living room and everyone comes and talks to me. So she feels a sense of ownership for her daughter-in-law's career. And I think once you can draw on that ecosystem to your advantage, uh, I think uh, you know, that's the only way as a working woman you can move forward, right? Ecosystem of nannies, of parents, in-laws. And then lastly, try and outsource things. You can't do everything. You can't take that apple pie. It's not happening, right? I mean, you can't go to bake the perfect cupcakes. Learn to live with it, right? It's not happening. So, you know, just just, just don't try and do everything because otherwise it'll all collapse. It just can't. You know, some days you just have to say, yes, so-and-so's mother bakes better cupcakes. You know, we live with it. You know. it's, it's, I, I don't know. I don't even want to switch on the microwave. So it's fine. You know, my daughter's learned to live with it. <laughs> Uh, what is your perspective on how women are different as compared to men when it comes to running a business? Are they better decision makers? Are they less risk takers? And how does that influence the outcome of businesses? I think definitely more empathy. I think uh, what I felt different when uh, with me with the my male colleagues was that I wasn't uh, I didn't feel embarrassed to bring my personal issues to work, and I didn't feel I didn't feel anyone around me should feel uh, embarrassed. If on a Thursday afternoon at 12 o'clock you need to go meeting as a male or a female, you can talk about it. You don't have to pretend I have a meeting in that part of town and you know misrepresent etc. It's perfectly fine. Similarly, like on a Saturday or a Sunday, because investment banking clients do call you on Saturdays and Sundays, if you need to go and you need to sacrifice that personal time, that's also fine. So I think the important thing is to not be, I think mean, that's what women bring. They sort of let you bring your personal life into work and not feel embarrassed about it and you know, you not, not say the only town time I'll have is when I go to have a beer with my colleagues etc. You know, that person life is important. You acknowledge it, you bring it to, uh, to, to work, not all the time, but you know, if you need, women bring that empathy to work, which I think ensures longevity. Are women less risk takers? I don't think so. I think women are equal risk takers, and you know, have done a, have done a great job uh, you know, running organizations when given the chance. And financial services, I think, has consumer companies have been the best in terms of encouraging and retaining female talent. And you've seen the results in India. The financial services are mostly led by women and really smart, strong women. Right? Uh, who run uh, organizations of 20, 30 billion dollars in market money. Globally, would you see a JP Morgan or a Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley? We've never seen a local female CEO. We've seen it in every Indian form. So, you know, that's something to be said about what financial services are doing and how the tech world and the manufacturing world now needs to ape some of that construct. Um, on a more uh, sort of, you know, personal note, you've done so well. Uh, but are there any regrets? So, if Manisha was to go back in time, say, 10 years, would you change anything? Yeah, I think I would definitely like to have more kids. I think having, and Chavi, that's a message for you I since I keep that. telling you to have a kid. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I would have loved to, again, this is my kid playing as you can see, but yeah, I think I would love to have more kids just for my daughter's sake. I think you know, my daughter ticks my maternity box, but I think I, I feel bad for her that I didn't tick her sibling box. So, so she's fine. She's absolutely okay at this point, but I, I feel more. Uh, you know, I think a family gives you a perspective at work, which is also great because, you know, otherwise, I, I mean, I had my only child nine years into marriage and I think my life was just so unilaterally and unidimensionally focused on work. Losing every mandate was so personal. My husband and I are competitors. If I lost to my husband, it would be like just the most personal, horrible thing, right? But I think a kid sort of gives you a perspective that, you know, there's more to life than this thing. More will happen, you know. Uh, a lot of time my daughter is just just chill, it's okay. And by the way, nowadays my daughter runs my plane and the other day we were away on Christmas holidays and she's now 14 and she said to me, so how much money did you make from Wallace this year? And uh, Ken hasn't asked me this question, so I'm glad I don't work for you, but you know, the kids get involved in your success and, and that's nice. I think, I, I think uh, for any woman, I think a family gives a good perspective too, because I think if there's one area where women, as uh, you know, when they're working, uh, we, we maybe just get too unidimensionally involved. We're just so keen to focus, uh, to demonstrate our honesty and sincerity that we probably just, you know, and sometimes push ourselves too hard. And at some level, you do need to step back. You know, they are, you're all working for large organizations. They can take care of themselves. And uh, I think a family gives you that perspective. I, I, at least for me, I think I was just unidimensionally heading down the train wreck uh, till my daughter came in. Uh, 
Christine, yeah. Yeah. So is that the secret sauce yeah. to having it all? If there was, you know, young girls who are just joining the industry, like what would you tell them? What is the secret to your success? I think just love what you do, you know. If you don't like it, like a lot of people quit investment banking because they felt this is just not for me. I can't do this 24 hour days. When the when a deal is live, you have to work through Saturday, Sunday. And if you don't like it, if it doesn't give you that adrenaline rush, don't do it because you know, then you're not going to be able to sustain it. Any career is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, it'll have its ups, it'll have its downs, there are times you you know, go and get along with your boss, there are times you may have to think of other alternatives in your career, or whatever, you know. When your business may not go the way it wants to. But you must love what you do. And I think I was lucky that accidentally I found a calling which I loved. And you know, 25 years into it, I'm still willing to do it. I still feel thrilled, you know, uh, saying I want this deal or I lost it. I feel terrible when I lost a deal. But you know, I, I still feel that rush. You know, I, you can wake me up in the middle of the night and say there's a pitch tomorrow morning and I'll be like, where? In Toronto, I'm ready to go, right? And so it's, yes, I love it. You know? And I think all of you must love it because that's the only way you will sustain it if you have your own passion. That's all. So you listen, thank you. I think that I think I should do uh, lose up on and I think join firms, do some more. Even if they're not that's really important because I think so just try and find the most straight.